Well, hi everyone and greetings from Northern Michigan. This is Bob the Science Guy and good news everybody, Brian has gotten rid of his frat boy hat. So I think we're off to a good start here. Unfortunately, the fact that the atmosphere rotates with the earth appears to confuse our professional engineer friend here. Um, let's go see if we can help him out a little bit. Hi, I'm Brian Mullen and this is Balls Out Physics episode 1.1. A spinning atmosphere. Now, I just noticed the other day that my very first video, Balls Out Physics Episode 1, Planes Flying on a Spinning Ball, was reposted on another channel on November 6th. And since then, it's gained over a quarter of a million views. Now, that's surprising. I don't know how that works, but it's awesome because it gets people thinking about this problem. When I first started looking into the idea of a rotating Earth and, and really thinking about that and applying it to the everyday world I see, one of the first things I thought about were planes flying above a spinning Earth. And I talked about that in that video. And I couldn't really find, actually I couldn't find a rel a, any type of relativity problem that used planes and a moving Earth. Now, there's tons of relativity problems out there showing trains and cars and other things that are moving on a surface that is assumed to not be moving, but there's nothing that takes into account, at least since I haven't, I haven't looked since then, that accounts for an Earth moving with the planes. Well, then, Brian, I hate to tell you this, but I don't think you looked very hard. Uh, I also would think that somebody that had actual training in physics could probably figure out how trains and automobiles would possibly relate to aircraft and atmospheres. But uh, I guess the only thing I can tell you is let's see if this video will help you out a little bit because you're kind of struggling with this and I want to make sure that you do things safely, you know? So let's cue up the music and see what we have. So here we go, folks. Now, if you scroll through the comments on that video, I posted a link to where my video has been reposted. People saying the same thing that even I said is, of course, the air slows the plane down because my argument was an object in motion stays in motion unless acted upon by an outside force. So what's slowing the planes down? Because I said the atmosphere, how is the, I didn't make the statement, which I should have done, about my assumption of an atmosphere spinning with the earth. How, how can that be? And so... I implied in the video that the planes, why aren't the planes going into orbit? Okay, now we know in this reality that planes slow down because of air resistance. That's obvious. The whole point of that episode was to get people thinking about it so we can try to explain this. Yes, they slow down due to air resistance, and that's why they have engines to counter that air resistance. Remember our basic parameters of flight. Now, here is the air resistance. Here is the thrust of the engine. These two balance. They are in balance at any given speed. So just like lift and gravity are in balance. That's just, you know, the basic, basic aerodynamics. That's day one of ground school for... Uh, any pilot training. Uh, you should know this. So this video is about the concept of a spinning atmosphere and why I have a lot of trouble with it and really why I ignored the spinning atmosphere in my very first episode. So let's say we're looking down on the North Pole of the, the globe Earth and the Earth is rotating, spinning, or I should say rotating. People have given me some criticism for I should say rotating instead of spinning because they said it's being deceptive to say spinning. But I mean, spinning, no, it's rotating, just we rotating, use rotating. Same thing. So anyway, Earth is rotating, right? And so let's say we're going to freeze the Earth at that moment. 
freeze the Earth with the atmosphere around it, assuming that the atmosphere is rotating with the Earth. And that's what I have drawn on the board here. Okay. So here's the Earth down here. All right. And let's say that this line right here is the equator. When you're looking down on it, the equator is right here. Okay. So we're just going to say this line is the equator. And then this is the edge of the atmosphere up here. And then there's space out here. Now, this is obviously not the scale. This is just conceptual. Okay. So at the equator, the circumference of the Earth is roughly 25,000 miles. And so to figure out the instantaneous velocity of the Earth as it spins around its axis on the equator, you divide the circumference by the time it takes to make one revolution, which is 24 hours. And okay. when you do that, you get roughly 1,038 miles per hour. Okay. At the surface. And so we assume right here that this is the Earth rotating at 1,038 miles per hour. And I said in the video, and people have said uh, in the comments, that you can just say that that's zero. Okay. And so what I want to do is look at this atmosphere and look at three points and three elevations, okay, A, B, and C, and assume that we're looking at just one cubic foot of air. Okay, just to, to get our minds around this volume of air that's frozen in time right now. Okay, so all of it's moving, all the air is moving with the Earth in such a way that it appears station, relatively stationary. You know, we go outside, wind blows and moves around, but it's all moving with the Earth, and that's what slows the plane down because the, the atmosphere moves with the Earth. Okay, so point A, point B, and point C, all moving with the Earth. I mean, they could be blowing this way, they could be blowing down at this moment, but since we froze them, we know that it's all moving with the Earth and not getting left behind, right? That's the assumption. And so um, we, will, we will say at this moment, we expect all of these points of air to, to, to make one complete revolution and come back to the same spot in 24 hours, right? Because the atmosphere moves with the Earth. The atmosphere never gets left behind. So right off the bat, since we know the velocity is equal to distance divided by time, we can say that VA, the velocity of point A, is greater than the velocity of point B, which is greater than the velocity of point C. Because point A has a longer distance to travel in 24 hours than point B, and point B has a longer distance than C. Okay, so let's just take a moment and find out what that is, because uh, having looked at this tape before, I know we didn't do the calculation. So the formula to find this velocity will be the circumference, which is 2 pi times the radius, divided by the 24 hours. And that's what we have right there. Okay, At the surface, the radius is 4,000 miles. If we multiply that by 2 pi, divide it by 24, and we come up with 1,038. Now at 6 miles, it becomes, the radius becomes 4,006, multiplied by 2 pi, divided by 24 hours. And at 6 miles, we're going to have 1,048 miles per hour. Now, up at the edge of space is 62 miles above the ground, or 100 kilometers. So our radius now is 4,062 miles an hour. And if we get up here, it's 1,063 miles per hour. Now, what's the key thing right here? The key thing is that this is 25 miles an hour faster than that. Okay, now why is this such a little difference? Well, let me show you. First of all, let's go ahead and put a little image up here. Now, this is something that I did in one of my very first videos last November. I was talking about how the horizon forms a circle around an observer. So what I did was I got this 8-inch styrofoam ball. And here it is. Now, this styrofoam ball is 8 inches in diameter. The Earth is 8 
1,000 miles in diameter. So each inch on this ball is 1,000 miles. Now using that, I had a look at these pins up here. And you can see them right here, the purple pins. You see they've got a rather long head on them. That head is 3 eighths of an inch long. To this scale, that's 375 miles above the surface. The ISS would be cruising above the Earth here, one quarter inch above the surface. Where does the atmosphere go? See this center pin right here? And if you look up on the illustration, you see that that's buried all the way to the thick part of the head of the pin. That's about a tenth of an inch high right there. That's a hundred miles. The atmosphere is thinner than that. Okay, so what you have basically is an eight inch styrofoam ball with a heavy coat of paint on it. You know, some texture paint perhaps. That's about how thick the atmosphere is. So, it's a very, it, it's a very, it's a very thin coat of atmosphere above the spherical Earth. So we aren't dealing with something like Brian's talking about here, where we have a, uh, where we have uh, an Earth. Oops, hit the wrong one. Sorry about that. So we're not really dealing with a situation where we have the Earth down here at the bottom of the diagram, and then we have this enormous thick atmosphere. Okay. It's actually very, very thin. It would probably be at about the level of C down there where it says VC and there's a little arrow just to the right of it. That's about the thickness of the atmosphere to scale on his drawing. So let's look at a couple of implications from this real quickly. So if we have the Earth right here, all right, and we have a couple of packets of air. This one's right at the surface. That one's six miles up. That one is 62 miles up. Now, let's assume for the moment that that packet of air starts right here and is moving straight up like that. It's warm air and it's going directly above the surface where it is where it was generated. Okay, the sun beat down on the surface right here, warmed it up, and we get this packet of air that goes straight up into the air. That's one vector. The second vector is going to be in that direction, and that is the, the difference between the 1,038 miles here at the bottom and the 1,060 three miles here, an hour here at the top. So basically it's kind of like dragging behind a little bit. Much like if you see smoke coming up from a chimney and there's a slight breeze above it, that smoke will curl over a little bit and form like an arc downwind. So that's basically the, the vector diagram. So what's happening here is that the air, as it rises, starts here and ends up up there. And the wind speed up there, relative to the rotation of the Earth, would be about 25 miles an hour. But you're also dealing at 62 miles above the surface. The atmosphere is extraordinarily thin up there. And as a result, a 25 mile an hour wind at 62 miles is not the same as a 25 mile an hour wind at the thicker air on the surface as far as the amount of air pressure coming at you. So this is basically a, an error in conception that Brian's making right now. But we're going to let him continue for a little while and see where he takes this. Because the circumference of their path is greater, right? So I've got A up here at the edge of the atmosphere, space up here, B right here around six miles where planes fly, and C near the surface of the Earth. Okay. So this rotation here, the theory is that this, the Earth is rotating about its axis 
because of the Big Bang. When you really think about it, there was this Big Bang, everything exploded out into space. Planet okay, now this stuff about the Big Bang really doesn't have anything whatsoever to deal with what we're talking about right now. It's extraneous, and I don't want to prolong the video talking about that because it's not relative to this conversation. So everything's just been moving for billions of years, and there's no friction between space and the atmosphere, right? Because there's nothing in space, so an object in motion stays in motion unless acted upon by an outside force, right? But that's kind of strange when you think about that air at higher elevations has to be moving faster to keep up with the ground below it. Okay, so this is an, another error in conception that he has. Now, we've already shown right here that what happens when you have a slightly, you have a little bit of a drag here on the air, 25 miles an hour at 62 miles above the atmosphere. It's less than that below it, okay? There is no requirement that the packet of air that starts right here ends up here. There's no difference with it ending up right back there because the packet of air that started right here is going to curve and end up there. You see, you, you following me? Now, if you look at the 25 mile an hour difference in rotational speed, you know, hourly rotational speed is 15 degrees an hour down here, right? That's going to lag by about 25 miles an hour at 62 miles. Why don't you do a little math problem here? Why don't you figure out how long it would take this packet of air right here? Hang on. Sorry about that. So, why don't you try and figure out how long it would take this packet of air right here on the, uh, on the right to lag behind far enough to end up right over the original spot. All right, now here's the way that you would set that up. It's basically 2 pi times 4,000 62 miles and uh, miles for the radius, and that will give you the circumference. How long will it take that to make a complete rotation at 25 miles an hour? Okay, you know that that's going to be at least 25,000. It's going to take at least a thousand hours or to lag far enough to actually get lapped by the earth underneath it, okay? So you can figure out the exact amount. That would be a great homework assignment for you. Okay, let's listen to a little bit more. Because air moves up and down, right? Hot air rises, as we know, and cool air sinks, right? So how does the air speed up? When it's when it, when it's heated, it rises, but then it's, it has to start moving faster. No, it doesn't. Uh, even if it's only a little bit faster, these the change difference in these velocities, if you calculate them, isn't much. But it, it, they do have to be greater, or they will start to get left behind. They are left behind. So, um, what? How that is explained? I don't know. I, I haven't really found anything to explain to to talk about how the air has to be moving faster. Okay, that's because it's not. Now, in order for the air to move faster, all right, and the air is coming up like this and curving back a little bit, and that is because there is a vector of force going this way, which is the hot air rising, and then there's also a vector of force going back that way, which is the 25 mile an hour lag at 62 miles. Okay, in order for that packet of air to not experience this lag, there would have to be a force of 25 miles per hour up here. There isn't one, so it just simply lags. There's nothing that would cause that forward force of 25 miles an hour. 
This is his error in judgment. He seems to think that this must rise straight up. It doesn't. It can lag a little bit. It's not going to make that much of a difference. And there is nothing that would cause it to accelerate in a horizontal vector. But another thing to think about is, you know, air isn't stationary like we're assuming in this problem, right? It's, it, it blows, it moves all over the place. And down here at the surface, air goes up and down over valleys and air actually speeds up as it goes up and uh, uh, as it goes over the top of a hill, it speeds up, it slows down, runs into mountains, goes through trees. You wonder why the air would speed up as it went down a mountain and slow down as it went up a mountain. It's almost as if there is a downward acceleration acting on it. Gravity, perhaps? There's things flying around in the air, different pressures. Now, all kinds of stuff is happening internally as it all moves with the atmosphere. Now, this is an interesting point that he's bringing up but not making the connection with. All right, we've got a 25 mile an hour lag at 62 miles in altitude, okay, at the edge of space. Now, what happens between those two points? Do we have high and low pressure areas that generate wind between them? What's a, what's a trade wind blow at? Much less a hurricane. Now, are there other things in the atmosphere that affect weather, perhaps, and cause winds. The jet stream is a 200 mile an hour wind. How does that compare to this 25 mile an hour thing he's uh, struggling with? All right, it really doesn't, does it? Now, I would think that eventually something's gonna have to, to, to give it a nudge to keep it moving with the earth, so to say. The, the energy would be lost, okay? But not to mention that, there are things that enter our atmosphere. There's meteors, all kinds of stuff is constantly, any, enter, is supposed to be entering the atmosphere from outer space. Okay, so you honestly think that a small meteor, I'm not talking about a, you know, end-of-life event type thing. You're talking about small meteors and things like that are going to have a significant impact on wind patterns? Uh, no. No, they really won't. Uh, there are two things that have to do with how air stays with the surface of the Earth. And they're really quite simple. So let's go over them real quick. So we've got, we're going to make the Earth a little blue this time because I want to make a nice, happy green tree here. Let's put a happy tree over here. Now that happy tree will happily suck in carbon dioxide and spit out oxygen. Okay. How fast is the Earth moving right here? Let's say 1,038 miles an hour. This tree is attached to the Earth right there, so how fast is the tree moving? 1,038 miles an hour. This oxygen came straight off of the tree, so how fast is it moving? 1,038 miles an hour. Conservation of momentum. There's nothing slowing it down. It's being released from a moving object. It will continue to move with that object until another force acts on it. All right. That's number one. Now, number two is imagine, if you would, a packet of air. Well, three of them stacked up on top of each other. Okay. So this air it's got some friction with the surface of the Earth. So the surface of the Earth, in addition to the air being released from the surface, will continue to drag the air along due to frictional forces. That air being dragged in that direction will drag along that packet of air in that direction, and that packet of air will drag the one on top in that direction. Are you going to lose a little bit of forward momentum with all this drag? Okay? Yes, you will. But remember, we're only trying to make up 25 miles an hour at 62 miles. You can lose a lot of that forward momentum and drop that change down to 5 or 10 miles an hour, perhaps. You can do the math. I don't care to. You basically get the concept here. Now, that will straighten out 
this curve that we had, okay? Because it's being dragged along. Now, is that gonna generate a tiny amount of heat? Of course it will. But how does that tiny amount of heat relate to the heat of the sun on the surface of the earth, okay? Insignificant, insignificant. And if you believe otherwise, you're welcome to do the math and do the comparisons. If you find that there's a significant difference, put it in the comments. I'd love to see what it is, and then I'll check it. So that is pushing back on the atmosphere and wanting to slow it down. So the common explanation for how the atmosphere keeps up with the surface of the Earth is by friction between the air at the surface. There's, let me use a red marker for this. There's friction here pushing back on this cubic foot of air down here that's at the surface. And then that's transferred through internal friction, for internal shear forces within the, the fluid, because air is essentially a fluid, okay? It has viscosity. And so it's, these internal shear forces are transferred all the way up throughout the layers of air, right? Just that. Okay, now another way that you can see this particular effect is take a wooden doll and put it in an electric drill. Okay, just a smooth round dowel. And then stick that in a paint can with some water in it and turn the drill on. Now, even though there's not a lot, it's not like a paddle or a spoon or something, you know, paint stick or anything, it's just a smooth wooden dowel, but there's enough friction on that dowel as it spins that eventually it's going to start the water spinning. And that water will extend spinning all the way out to the edge after a while. It's not going to spin perhaps as fast as the doll's moving, but the fact that that, that smooth doll of relatively small diameter can even get the rim of that water moving, you know, just from the friction of spinning, Imagine what, would, what that dowel would do with maybe at most a quarter of an inch of water around it. How fast would it get that water moving? And then look at something that's a little bit more like that, okay? So again, these frictional forces are actually rather significant. And again, all we're trying to do is we're trying to play catch up with maybe 25 miles an hour of lag at 62 miles. Below that, it's considerably less. Air pushing against itself, the friction carries that, that force all the way up to keep the atmosphere moving with the Earth, right? Well, yep. the problem I have with that, that doesn't make, the, thing, the thing that doesn't make sense to me, and this is why this, a lot of this is why I ignored it in the, the first episode, though I didn't explain it, is when you create friction, you create heat. You rub our hands together. It's actually kind of cool here today. Rub my hands together to warm them up. It creates heat. Heat is essentially kinetic energy. And so when something creates heat on the Earth, or when the Earth is heat heated by the sun, where does that heat go? Well, if you watch Balls Out Physics episode 4.1, I talked about how the accepted explanation for how they, you know things don't just get hotter and hotter and hotter is that it radiates out into space, right? Okay, we're going to go ahead and go over this discussion in episode 4.1, all right? But the bottom line is this. Yes, there is a small amount of heat generated. Yes, we do have radiant heat going back off into space. That's why it's colder in the winter on clear nights than it is on cloudy nights, and that's why it's colder in the moonlight than it is under the shade of a tree at night, okay? That has to do with, re with radiated heat. We'll go over that in another episode, though. Okay, we don't have very many more minutes in this, and I want to try and keep this down as short as possible, so let's just go ahead and charge on. So, not only... Does the speed of the air relative to the surface of the Earth have to increase as you go up in elevation because the path it has to travel, the length of the path, the circumference, increases? Um, 
we also have this problem with losing energy. I don't understand how this could work. Well, while this is an interesting discussion of kinetic energy, um, again, we're dealing with a, a failure of comprehension here. Brian's assertion is, is that if the, uh, the uh, air continues to rise directly above a single spot on the Earth, um, you know, as we had talked about over here, uh, coming coming up in basically that direction, okay, he maintains that the velocity would increase and the kinetic energy would be um, transformed to heat and lost off into space. Well, what he's not taking into account is, number one, the fact that the air does not have to stay directly above the exact spot on Earth. It does lag behind a little bit due to rotation and the friction of the atmosphere doesn't necessarily make up for that. The other thing that he's not taking into account uh, when he looks at this negative energy equation is the fact that the driving force of this air rising to begin with is heat. And that heat is applied from an external source, specifically the sun. So between the fact that he has an error in setting the problem up by assuming that there has to be some horizontal force dragging the, uh, the air forward to keep it above the same spot on the Earth, which is a non-existent force, and not taking into account the fact that the sun is adding energy and heat to this equation. He's just kind of out there a little bit. But let's let him continue. Yeah, until I'm making this video. So how does, how does this atmosphere keep up with the Earth? And this is why, in the very it first doesn't, episode, Brian. I really was saying, how do planes not go into orbit? Because how does the atmosphere, in a sense, keep up with the Earth? I probably should have made this video first. Well, the problem that you're running into is rather simple. The atmosphere essentially does keep up with the Earth. Yes, it lags behind a little bit, maybe 25 miles an hour at 62 miles. But that's not going to change the fact that an, a balloon sitting right here is going to stay over that spot on the Earth as it goes up and down. All right? It's not going to have a very significant drift, quote unquote, due to the rotation of the Earth. Say this balloon is up at 3,000 feet or a mile. Let's just simply do the math again. Uh, it's 2 pi times 4,000, um, let's say 5,000 feet. So that's 4,001 minus 2 pi times 4,000 divided by 24 hours. So what's the, uh, what's the difference going to be there? I'm going to go ahead and stop the uh, recording for a second. Let's go ahead and figure it out. Well, folks, there's your answer. 2 pi times 4,000 one mile for the radius minus 2 pi times 4,000 mile for the radius divided by 24 hours is 25,173 miles minus 25,167 miles. That's 6 miles in 24 hours. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is a quarter of a mile an hour difference. What are the winds at 5,000 feet? Do you think they're greater than a quarter of a mile? Do you think those winds may have a little bit more of an effect on that balloon than that quarter of a mile an hour drag? So that's how I feel about this. Um, please keep the discussion going. I'm going to post a comment on the repost of my first video saying that I made another video to, to keep this discussion going because that's what this is all about. It's just talking about this world. And uh, if, if you agree with my analysis or you don't, or you just want to keep the discussion going, please go to the video. I posted a link in the description below and like my comment so it'll get bumped to the top so people can see this video and then we can keep this going to, to figure out what's going on here. Because okay, I, I think we have figured out what's going on here. So let's just go ahead and, and sum some things up. Okay. All right. So we've got a couple of things. First of all, we have an Earth 
we have air that goes up and it does drag a little bit behind. A very small amount, 25 miles an hour at 62 miles. Very, very little compared to the rise rate due to the heating of air and it's rising through the atmosphere. Second of all, this 25 miles an hour is significant. The jet stream is 200 miles an hour. Trade winds are, you know, at, the, at altitude and even mid altitudes can be 25 to 100 miles per hour. Okay? This is nothing. And then finally, we did an experiment or a calculation involving a hot air balloon going up one mile. And we found that the drag rate on that is less than 25, 0 0.25 miles per hour, which is nothing. In an area of the atmosphere where we have winds of 15, 20, 30 miles an hour. So it's completely insignificant. And as a matter of fact, due to the frictional dragging of the atmosphere around the Earth, which you can demonstrate with a doll in the paint can, it's probably considerably less than a quarter of a mile an hour at 5,000 feet. So once again, we see a flat earth argument that sounds good because somebody heard it on a YouTube video, maybe a YouTube video put out by a civil engineer that should be able to do these calculations easily using the authority of that civil engineering degree to put out drivel like this and raise a question to people that aren't going to do the math that say, oh yeah, well, how can this possibly happen? It's not, you know, it, it's these huge numbers in this very thick atmosphere with a little tiny earth in the middle of it spinning at however many rounds per minute they, they like to do with the tennis balls. All right. This is silliness. And quite frankly, even a very basic calculation by somebody that makes that does calculations for a living should see that this is completely insignificant and not even, you know, simply something that you ignore. Yet they want to sit down and put out videos saying that this is a question about about the validity of the spherical earth. But this this has to do with things like the Coriolis effect, which uh, sl slow winds blowing over very vast distances under the tiny influence of the rotation of the Earth can lead to that bending. But that's another episode, and I think he actually will be touching on the Coriolis effect, and we'll handle, handle that admirably at that time. In the meantime, this is Bob the Science Guy signing out from northern Michigan. Thank you for bearing with me on this, uh, trying to keep the times down. But I think that this is good information to counter very bad information from somebody that should know a lot better than this. So, take care, guys. This rabbit hole's too deep for me Feel my brain getting real sore Bye-bye, Bob, the science guy